Hi, I'm Johnny Engineer Termel, and Michael Spottiswood's trying to get his automobile back. He'd been busted, moving his garden, marijuana medicine. Then he got an exemption, can now possess five times more than he was busted with. He's going to end up beating his charges, but they wouldn't give him back his car, and they seized it. So he asked the first judge, said no jurisdiction, can't help, want to. Asked the highest court in Ontario, Superior, she said no jurisdiction, want to help, but can't. So went to the Court of Appeals, said one of those guys got to have power to do this, if it's, you know, a threat to my life. And before we could get an answer, the crowd said we're giving him back his car, and that way we won't get an answer out of this, and they're trying to duck the appeal. That's what this is about. October 22nd, 2012, from Michael K. Spottiswood, appellant to Christopher Green, Crown Attorney. Dear Sir, on October 23rd, 2012, I'm asking the Ontario Court of Appeal to overturn the decisions accepting the Crown argument that Ontario's lower courts had no jurisdiction to offer relief against seizure of my vehicle, which has caused damage to my knees that such crown control over the seized asset is totally free from judicial oversight. Two, the appeal has been perfected, but for the Crown's failure to comply with the rules by serving and filing the appeal books and your respondent's factum. Three, I received notice that on September 28, 2012, the Crown had moved the court ex parte to order the release of my vehicle on October 28, 2012, after the 30-day appeal period to Superior Court had expired, five days after my appeal hearing date. When I called your office to find out why your documents hadn't been filed, Kelly Lowe told me the Court of Appeal Duty Counsel, Russ Silverstein, had been advised, and he would tell me what the Crown intended to do for my appeal. Silverstein explained that you were not going to comply with the rules of the court because the return of the vehicle not only moots the no auto issue, but also moots the no jurisdiction issue. Well, Mr. Silverstein has nothing to do with my appeal, so why did you choose him as intermediary instead of informing me directly? Was he supposed to convince me getting my car back? Maybe on the 28th, if there's no appeal, was as good as getting it back for sure on the 23rd? Five. I complied with my part under the rules months ago, and now, weeks before the appeal, three weeks, you decide to give the car back and think it calls everything off? You should have sought a direction from the court or a dispensation with complying with the rules of the court. Instead, you chose to refuse to comply, hoping a promise later moots delivery now, and that the dismissal of the appeal would let you keep your precedence. Well, wouldn't it serve you right for the court not to let you speak because you didn't follow any arguments about which to speak? Six, I can appreciate the Crown's dilemma. The Spottiswood decisions ruling that there is no judicial oversight over seized assets are now precedents that the Crown would dearly love not to have overturned. But your factum would have to explain why no judicial oversight, a pretty tough sell when it takes a court order for its release. 7. Yet these precedents could now be used the next time the court seizes some cripple's wheelchair to prevent him from getting it back. He'd have to start in lower court facing the spot as with no jurisdiction precedent. If he then sought the return of his wheelchair in superior court, he'd face the spot as with no jurisdiction precedent there too. Only after losing at both levels could he then challenge those precedents at the Court of Appeal to find out which lower court, both bemoaning their lack of power to do the humanitarian thing, had power to order the return of his wheelchair. 8. To keep the precedents without having to write reasons explaining why there's no judicial oversight, you had to find a way to get my appeal dismissed on some technicality. So you tried returning the car too late. 9. A. That the auto may be returned someday if no one appeals within a 30-day appeal period seems not a valid ground to moot whether it should be returned right now. Had you in fact returned the auto before the October 23rd appeal date, that argument may have held slight sway. But since the 30-day appeal period only expires on October 28th, the appeal really can't be mooted on October 23rd by a promised unfulfilled order. You gave up the car five days too late, and I'm still asking the court for my car back on the 23rd. Dare you argue, don't give the cripple back his wheels today because he might get them back later if there's no appeal. 
dare the court dismiss my appeal, ruling it's only five more days doing without. And promised relief tomorrow moots your claim for actual relief today. While Mr. Silverstein did his best to convince me you were right, that relief promised tomorrow moots relief demanded today, but I disagree. 10. B. I'm not appealing any refusal to return my auto. There was no decision on the merits of returning the auto. Made in light of the ruling, there was no jurisdiction. I'm appealing the refusal of the courts to accept jurisdiction. 11. If it weren't a matter of urgency, the Court of Appeal could still send the issue of the return back down to the right lower court to be adjudicated. Despite both judges having opined they would have returned the applicant's mobility for humanitarian reasons, if they had the power, that doesn't guarantee the next judge will come to the same conclusion. No decision on merits yet exists to be appealed. Therefore, return of the auto is irrelevant to this appeal. It is the jurisdictional precedents that are being appealed. 12. Mr. Silverstein did his best to convince me you were right that mooting the auto relief also mooted the jurisdiction relief. I disagreed and told him the return of the car was only incidental to the challenge to the no jurisdiction precedents. If the decisions are precedents the Crown may continue to use, they are precedents I may continue to try to overturn. And whether the auto is returned or not is irrelevant to whether the no jurisdiction precedents should be upheld or overturned. Returning the car may moot the Court of Appeals decision on the return of the car, but cannot moot their decision on who had the actual jurisdiction, right? 13. Of course, Silverstein didn't call to inform me you weren't filing your response. I had to call him to find out. Was I to remain uninformed so you could show up totally unprepared to proceed and it would be a big surprise? That way, if the court rejects your everything is now moot argument, your last hope would be to plead for more time to prepare your factum to fully address all the serious implications raised because unfortunately, disingenuously, you sincerely believe that relief promised tomorrow mooted relief demanded today, and that's why you came unprepared and need an adjournment until after the 28th, no doubt. 15. So you expected your duty counsel friend to help me have my appeal mooted. Well, he won't even be opening his mouth. If anyone helps me, it won't be your friend. It'll be my Mackenzie friend, MC, John Turmel who last year was permitted by Justice Rosenberg's court to help explain the appeals of Terrence Parker, Gary Pallister, Mark McDonald, Deborah McIntyre, Rob McGrady, Wayne Hearn, and Sean Maloney, which he had drafted. 16. I instructed Mr. Silverstein to inform you that I intended to ask the court to proceed with my appeal on the grounds, one, that the issue with the return of the auto on the 23rd is not mooted while I still don't have my car. Two, that even if any phantom no-car appeal is mooted by its promised return, the real appeal against the jurisdictional precedents is not mooted by solution of the no-car appeal. And three, that I demanded you comply with the rules of the court for filing the required documents before the date of the hearing, and that you not presume my appeal for relief on October 23rd has been mooted by promised later, maybe if not appeal within 30 days, relief on October 28th. 17. Since you have not filed the required documentation, and this was the day before, to comply with the rules, I must surmise you hope to plead for more time should your decision for refusing to comply be found wanting. 18. I'm cautioning you not to come to court hoping to plead unpreparedness, but if you so gamble, don't expect to win much extra time. If the court accords you a day or two to catch up to where you should have been <clears throat> in compliance with the rules, will you dare argue you're not competent to put together a factum on short notice to absolve your previous non-compliance with the rules? So anyway, we showed up the next morning and... Uh, Sure enough, no paperwork by the Crown, and the first thing Justice Doherty said, and here are my notes before the Court of Justice Doherty, Epstein, and the third judge, I don't know. And I wrote bad news in discussing Mike Spottiswood's appeal hearing. Judge Doherty noted the car had been returned. Mike had to tell him it had not been, so it was put off until after the break. So now we continue. Doherty, Mr. Spottiswood, have you seen the order proposed here? Yes, I have a copy of it here. You told me you don't have it back yet, though. No, I don't have it back. 
I was wondering if the court would allow my Mackenzie friend to speak a few words on my behalf. He helped me prepare this appeal. Your which friend? My Mackenzie friend, John Termel. Could he speak a few words on my behalf? He'd be quicker, faster than I am. Yes, the Crown is saying your appeal is moot. The appeal is to get your car back, and you're getting your car back. Spot is what I understand, Your Honor. So what's to be said? Spot is what John could best expect that quickly, faster than me. Uh, Doherty, I didn't understand. Your Mackenzie friend? Yes. I'm not familiar with that term. Well, he's just a friend who's helped me prepare this appeal. Oh, I see. Sure. Who is that again? John Termel. Okay. So, the appeal is about the car. The car is going back. What do you have to add to that? So, had to be quick. He wants to get rid of me. No, the car was never judged on its merits. No jurisdiction was claimed by both of the lower courts. These are appeals against those no jurisdiction decisions. Not against any decision on the car, because no decision was made on the car. So, could I explain in a quick five minutes the history behind it? No, I don't think we have to hear that. Thank you. Well, at that point, I wrote, he'd been told that no judge below had refused to return the car. That they had said they could not, and the whole reasons of the decision were about jurisdiction, not the car. So, what was being appealed was not a refusal, but the claim of no judicial oversight. So, he knows it's the no jurisdiction decisions that created the no judicial oversight precedents the Crown wants to keep badly enough to give up the car that are really being appealed. And he didn't catch on or didn't want to know. But now that you think about it, how often does the Crown try and give up something so fast to avoid a hearing? He must have known there was something special going on. It also shows how judges come to court unprepared. He hadn't read our factum. And the Crown had not filed theirs nor the appeal books, right? Think about that. We'd filed ours, the only document in the file. And the Crown had filed nothing. And the court hadn't even read the only document in the file. Blind justice from the Ontario Court of Appeal. <clears throat> but considering how Justice Doherty didn't want to know any facts about the actual judgment being appealed, well, he was only interested in the issue of the car, which was not an issue under appeal. So he'd have known if he'd read the file. Who knows what else he didn't want to know in order to remain plausibly ignorant. So, there was really nothing more for me to say to a judge who isn't interested in hearing the facts about the appeal, was there? He wasn't interested in hearing about the issue under appeal in his haste to dismiss the issue that wasn't under appeal. <laughs> but in the final analysis, he was told, A, it was not an appeal about the car, and B, it was an appeal about the no judicial oversight precedence. And that's really all I had to do. Lucky I got it done in the first minute, or I'd have never got another chance. He said, thank you, it's just not anything that matters at this point. That's right. The actual facts of the appeal he should have read about doesn't really matter to him at this point. He's made up his mind. Thank you. Okay, sure, he slapped me down in front of the room. But at least, and I wasn't stupid enough to keep my mouth open and keep talking, right? Notice, I caught on right away what he'd done. But at least they're all rushing to Wiki, Mackenzie friend, and find out what else Justice Doherty didn't know about. And they'll learn from the engineer. But now that he barred me from telling him what the appeal was really about, he had to now pronounce a decision based on what the appeal was not about, when is incomplete facts. I'll get to uh, appeal another decision to the Supreme Court of Canada on the grounds that Doherty J's court didn't have its facts right because they hadn't even read the file. <laughs> I just love it forever. Doherty, so the crowd has consented to an order for the return of the car. That order will be implemented by when? Green. It was obtained the 28th of September, so October 28th. Doherty, so the Crown says the appellant will have his car back within the next week, the period following the criminal code? Green, yes, sir. Justice Doherty, the Crown has consented to an order for the return of the car. The 30-day appeal period will expire this week, and the car will be returned upon the expiry of that period. The appeal is dismissed as moot. So, the appeal to find out if anyone had the power to force them to give it back is avoided by them giving it back. <laughs> so, Outside, I was pretty mad, and of course, I'd been, you know, insulted, but I don't mind, I can take it. 
and uh, at least I didn't make a fool of myself by letting them hit me twice, and went out and did my final shot on the way out the door. Okay, Mike spot is wooden John Turmel at the Ontario Court of Appeal, where Mike had his appeal today before Justice uh, Doherty, Epstein, and a third judge. And it was dismissed as moot, which means, and it's all settled, here's what happened. First judge, first of all, Mike got busted, medical grower, they took his car. So we asked the first judge, Pakeli, can I have my car back? My knees are being damaged by no mobility. Judge Pakeli said, I want to, I would, but I can't, no jurisdiction. So we went to the next level of court, and we said, hey, he said he couldn't. We're asking the Superior Court, the highest court in Ontario, that has inherent jurisdiction to do anything that is just, to give the cripple back his wheels. The lady said, oh, no, no, the law says I can't do anything. No jurisdiction. So no decision on the car yet, just no jurisdiction. She said, I want to give it to you, but I can't. So we filed an appeal into the Ontario Court of Appeal, saying one of the two judges below had to have jurisdiction, because this isn't your bailiwick giving back cars. It's got to be done below. We want to know which does because the Crown's got two precedents now, saying they can take anybody's car and there's no judicial oversight allowed. Get it? Well, they want these decisions. So what did they do? Three weeks ago, they issue an order, ask the court to release the car, they give him back his car. Except after a 30-day appeal period, which happens in five days. So he doesn't have his car back yet. So now they're arguing that because they're gonna give him back his car later, that means his appeal to get his car back right now should be dismissed as moot. No need to debate it no more. Well, we were inside. We were going to try and explain to the judges how this is not moot. We're appealing the issues of jurisdiction. Nobody decided on the car. The next judge might not give him back the car, even if those two wanted to. So the issue was jurisdiction. And the Crown's trying to get out of the issue of do they have jurisdiction over us or not. They love no judicial, no oversight. So they give the car back and now they go in there and they tell the judge, hey, we're giving back the car in five days. So that means he's got no grounds of appeal right now on anything. And Justice Doherty, and we've had him before, decided that because they're giving back the car, the issues of jurisdiction are mooted and the Crown can keep their precedence. Which means we got no choice but to go file another appeal in the Supreme Court of Canada against another one of Justice Doherty's blunders. Okay? Yep. He didn't even give us the time to explain. Nope. He just judged right away, oh, getting back the car, moot. I don't want to hear any more. Well, it's easy to come to a conclusion that's wrong when you won't hear the facts. And that's what happened today in front of Justice Doherty's court. So we got to appeal it to the Supreme Court of Canada, who usually do nothing, no matter how egregious the decisions below. We don't expect much done, but at least it's going to go on record that Justice Doherty blew it again, and we had to file another appeal against another one of his bad decisions. John Turmel logging out of the Ontario Court of Appeal at Osgoode Hall in Toronto, October 23rd. Pretty damn depressed he didn't give us the time to listen to the facts. Amen.